So I first want to say thanks for, for inviting me along to do this talk, Angus. I, I'm, I was quite excited about it. Um, I, I also want to say that we're going to deliver a bit of a talk, uh, Bob and I will, based around uh, a university perspective of Scottish geology. But bear in mind, it's just one university. That's the university that we uh, both work at at the moment. But we'll probably also touch a little bit uh, on our experience from where we did our undergrad or postgrads. So here's a lovely picture of Bob and I with some very happy students in an absolutely scorching day uh, in Ascent. Uh, and uh, um, it was about 30 degrees that day. And the one thing that they learned was that they all had to carry a lot more water than they were expecting to in Scotland. So hello, and thanks for uh, having us along. Um, that's me on the left there. Uh, and that's Bob on the right. And again, a wonderful picture in Assen. We're currently both at Leeds. Um, I have more of a teaching focused role. Uh, Bob has more of a research role, but we both do a little bit of the other. And Bob has become very heavily involved in our field teaching uh, over the past couple of years. And, uh, and we're really lucky for it because he's a fantastic field geologist and a very good teacher. We're both alumni of the University of Glasgow. I did my undergrad and both my um, postgrad, my PhD at Glasgow. Bob did his undergrad at Glasgow. Um, I was getting towards the end of my PhD when Bob started his undergrad. Uh, and that's where I met Bob um, initially. And Bob eventually found his way back to Leeds to do um, his geochemistry masters and then went away to do his PhD in Durham and then back at Leeds for some um, postdoc work. So like I said, what we want to talk about um, is just a bit of one perspective and that's the perspective we have of how Scottish geology really lends itself well to higher education and what we do at university and especially we're going to talk about what we do at Leeds. Uh, we didn't want to design this talk as being um, terribly exhaustive about what we do at Leeds or tell you all the wonderful things about Scottish geology, which most of you already know. But we wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of how we look at it and, and where we think things possibly could go for the benefit uh, of Scottish geology and for higher education. And really, we don't want to spend too much time on the talk because we would much rather that we, we sort of kick off a conversation about this. So uh, it'll kind of run this way. We'll talk a little bit about what Scottish geology offers higher education as far as we're concerned and how specifically we use it at Leeds. And then we'll talk about a, a bit of future scanning. And Bob will talk a little bit about beyond the taught skills and the nuts and bolts of what we're trying to get across to the students uh, in terms of the things they will need to complete their degree. So Bob will talk a little bit about the extra stuff and how we also feel that that ties in with boosting uh, uh, you know, Scottish geology in terms of um, tourism and going further and beyond what we do at higher education. So what can Scottish geology uh, offer universities? Well, I think you're not gonna be surprised that it is an absolute lot. And this is no surprise to any of you. I'm sure we're all here or part of Scottish Geological Trust because we believe that Scotland has absolutely outstanding uh, um, geology and geoheritage. So we know that there's uh, a phenomenal variety of rocks and ages of rocks uh, represented in Scottish geology. And also there are a huge suite of environments and processes recorded in those rocks themselves. And all we really have to do is just have a look at that wonderful geological map, sheet one in the north of Scotland to really see uh, the great variety that's here, there. Uh, many of us who've had a formal education in the UK based around geology have probably also had uh, Scottish geology or the assembly of the British Isles used as a great vehicle for teaching geology. Um, and I certainly had that experience at the University of Glasgow and so did Bob. So we're really, really lucky. Um, I think for the size of the UK, um, never mind Scotland, but if we think about all of the UK, for the size of the UK um, compared to a lot of other countries in the world, we probably have a, one of the largest variety of ages and varieties of rock types and environments and processes recorded. So we're really lucky about that. And uh, I'm sure this could be an argue, arguing point with anybody who, who I might um, term a Sassanac, which would is what some Scottish people refer to as uh, English people and Southerners, but I would probably argue that Scotland has a larger variety and more exciting set of rocks than England has to offer. But there you go, that, that, that's a, a talking point we can have later on. Um, 
we know that there's a, a great history in terms of birth of many aspects of the science and geology. Everybody knows about James Hutton. Um, but I like to think uh, of some of the main things that we've seen birth through that science, not just Hutton's theory of the earth, um, but, but, but also things like uh, uh, actually figuring out whether the Plutonists or the Neptunists were right. And anybody who's ever been to Glen Rosa uh, on Arran or, or Glen Tilt, um, they'll, they'll know the history uh, of, of settling that argument, whether igneous rocks were formed from a primordial ocean or, or whether they, they were actually um, formed from molten materials that solidified. And then there's also Hutton section uh, at, uh, at, at Salisbury Crag. So, so there's birth of many aspects of the science. Uh, and even I would say as so far as to go to talk about uh, wonderful maps like um, the Isle of Mull where you can look at the history of, of these areas being mapped and you could say, well, these rocks were being mapped out uh, and, and they were at the nascence of our understanding of the plumbing that was going on uh, underneath volcanoes. So in other parts of the world, you have active uh, volcanology. That's one of the things we don't have in Scotland, but what we did have was we had the plumbing systems well exposed. Uh, I think Bob and I were chatting about this. One of the things that, um, a couple of things that we don't have represented in Scottish geology are, are really active tectonics and active volcanism. And there's certain types of quaternary deposits we don't have well represented either, but you'd have to go to the equator to find them uh, at the surface now anyway. Um, there are a lot of paradigm changing firsts and world-class sites we have represented among Scottish geology. And one aspect uh, that I like to talk about a lot is one that everybody knows about, which is um, the sort of idea of thrust tectonics. Uh, and, and we know it, it uh, it sort of developed around that Highlands controversy um, in Ascent, uh, but at the same time, there was something similar being developed in the continent. So we can't lay claim to, to all of the, the firsts because they were happening at the same time, even though the scientists didn't really know what was going on in, in, in both places. But we have paradigm changing firsts and world-class sites represented all over Scotland. Another thing I think people don't think about often is that we actually have international cities uh, with geology on the doorstep. So Edinburgh and Glasgow are both huge cities and the variety of geology that you can tap into from first making your way to, to either of these two cities is phenomenal. And if you're basing yourself in Glasgow for a holiday or for, for some educational purposes and you're visiting a lot of the West Coast, uh, it's not very difficult to actually get yourself over to Edinburgh and vice versa. So I know when I was an undergrad and teaching at Glasgow, uh, we did have field trips out to Fife and also to Edinburgh. And these were simple day trips that were easy to, to undertake um, even, even on the other side of Scotland. There's also a very, very deep history um, of the science and technology related to geology, especially in the central belt. So if we think about how geology uh, has been exploited for natural resources and the role that's played um, in the Industrial Revolution, we see evidence of that all over the place. And I think one of the interesting things um, that I think that Scottish geology can start to offer to universities now, which is a little bit different from the traditional fieldwork that we might go out and do up in the hills and on the coasts, relates to these last two points. Not only do we have excellent geology that's exposed uh, on the doorsteps of uh, our two major cities, um, but because we have that deep history uh, related to science and technology uh, that relates to our geology, especially in the central belt, um, I think Scotland is very, very well placed for what we would call urban geology. And that's something, uh, if some of you are not really familiar with, maybe we can talk a little bit about later on when we have our chat. So um, urban geology is a way to, um, very quickly, if I was, it's a way to undertake a, a lot of geological uh, teaching um, that doesn't involve you developing the field skills uh, out far away from the cities. And, and therefore it's a type of geology that is going to, going to be quite important going forward to create sustainable futures uh, for everybody, but also um, it's a cheaper way to do field work to a degree. And um, it's also field work that is a lot more accessible, which is also becoming uh, an issue um, with respect to teaching geology and higher education at the moment. Um, traditionally, the field classes that a lot of us might have done if we have done uh, uh, degrees in the past, um, they're kind of being challenged by some of um, the younger staff 
that are coming into universities and teaching and doing research because it is important that we are seen to be able to make our teaching accessible to people um, that may have disabilities uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, so urban geology is something that I think Scotland uh, can offer very, very, very nicely. We have geoparks uh, and I'll touch a little bit more about the geoparks later on. Uh, obviously the geopark that most people know of and use very well is the Northwest Highlands Geopark. Uh, especially the um, visitor center at uh, uh, Knock and Crag Elfin. It's absolutely wonderful and we make great use of that uh, on our field trips. But what I want to try and touch on at the end of this, my portion of the talk anyway, um, is how I think there's maybe a bit more that we can do with respect to, to geoparks uh, and how we can actually offer more to Scottish universities, uh, uh, English universities, Welsh universities, but also to universities and education institutions from around the world. And also not just thinking about higher education, but secondary and even primary education. I think geoparks can, can offer more to all of those levels of education, as well as to tourists and to just people who want to know more about, about Scottish geology who live in Scotland and in England and Wales. The last point is it's an absolutely beautiful and accessible country. Um, it's not by chance that most major car manufacturers end up using stretches of uh, roads in the highlands for their advertisements because the scenery is just absolutely breathtaking. And we get to see this when we go out in the field and it's a wonderful experience that goes beyond just being in, in an environment where um, you can be inspired to learn about geology and, and Bob will touch a little bit upon that. And we have the right to roam, which is quite unique in Britain. So it, it makes access a little bit easier, I think, than it, than it does in other parts of the UK. Although, of course, if you are going to be trying to access um, an estate where there's shooting that goes on or, or some of the land is used for, 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 you know, farming or other uses, we have to be very mindful about adhering to the country code. But the right to roam, I think, is something which is fantastic because um, it does offer a lot less red tape to get out and do things. So what do we do specifically at Leeds? I'll run through um, a couple of the things that we do where we specifically go to Scotland um, to do field work. Now, what I haven't covered in this talk at all is the huge amount of uh, Scottish geology we look at within our taught courses, either as examples of specific types of uh, case studies. So for example, I'll look at the, um, the Isle of Mull in a case study that I deliver in my geological mapping class at level one. And there are people that use different aspects of, of Scottish geology in all sorts of aspects of their teaching. Uh, so there's too much to really go through there. Uh, but one of the things we have embedded into our brand new level one teaching that we, we offer in our new geological sciences program at Leeds, we've actually revamped the program over the last year, is we have reintroduced using the assembly of the British Isles as a vehicle to teach uh, a, a lot of the core concepts at level one. That was something that Leeds had in, in the program years and years ago. Uh, but when we went away from large modules and then went to small top 10 credit modules, everything got broken up and became far more sort of pocketed knowledge and skills based and, and you lost the ability to tell things through a story. So that's something we've brought back talking about the evolution of the British Isles uh, and using that as a vehicle to teach some of the major concepts that, that level one students learn. And it's a wonderful way to do it. Uh, and you know, half of that story is the geology of Scotland. I would argue more than half of it, but there you go. In terms of field courses, um, we uh, for years have run a field course that goes to the Lead Hills and also visits Glen Devon and the Oak Hills. Um, and, and the course was a level one optional module all about gold and silver mineral deposits in the UK. So historic ones and also looking at, at uh, some of the new prospects, especially the, the, the Conanish mine. Now this course um, got cancelled overall in terms of being an optional module on its own because we've gone to a new program format, as I mentioned. However, what we have done is we've taken out bits of this particular course and we've embedded them um, in these new courses. Whether we'll still get to go to the Lead Hills uh, or Glen Devon remains to be seen. Uh, but here are a couple of pictures of us in Glen Devon. So the types of things we did in the field courses uh, would be to actually do uh, stream sediment sampling 
and sometimes we'd be digging trial pits to actually uh, see how much gold we could get out of a specific uh, um, area and volume and then calculate uh, that in terms of a, a potential prospect. So they, they were very sort of rudimentary skills that we were teaching the students uh, about stream sampling and estimating very, very small prospects. And it, it's, it was all based um, around placer type deposits. Here's uh, the course leader, Rob Chapman. Those of you who know about um, Scottish geology and Scottish gold and have read a few papers, you'll see that, uh, you'll know that his sort of name is ubiquitous. With Beyond level one, uh, one of the other main field courses that we offer is um, our main mapping training uh, and advanced field skills uh, residential field trip at level two, uh, and that's to Assent, to the Northwest Highlands. We, we call it the Assent excursion, but as you'll see when Bob talks a little bit more about it later on, uh, there's a lot more we explore in that general region. It's not just sort of the classic uh, areas that we look at. Uh, we go to the coast and, and we see a few different things. One of the things we used to see on that field trip, which I was terribly excited about, uh, was the stack fata member, which is that um, ejecta blanket of a bolide impact. Um, the Students always found that terribly exciting when you talked about it. Unfortunately, pressures for finances mean that we have to squeeze this field trip a little bit. And sadly, that's one of the days that's going to disappear. But I'll let Bob talk to you a little bit more about that. We, we stay in the Inchnadam Lodge. Uh, I'll show you a couple of quick pictures. Um, you know, this is the same place that most universities stay when they go up there and for good reason. And we'll touch upon that a little bit more later on as well. Uh, but you just can't beat it. Um, I think Inchnadamf, uh, as far as I can remember correctly, it, it means the sort of the, the clearing of the stags in Gaelic. Uh, and you can see why, because when the weather's really bad, they all come off the hills uh, and you could be teaching in the evening and you peer out uh, of, of the sort of main dining hall room and you see them all out there uh, munching away on that lovely grass. Um, and that lovely grass is, is very prevalent in that area because of the geology. You have a whole bunch of, of uh, Durness limestone all stacked up around there, and it does make for incredibly um, gorgeous green vegetation, and, and that's why they seem to hang around. And, and when we tell that to the students, they get, you know, they, that's one of the main, main reasons they, they, they start to get excited about the geology there because we can give them little bits of information like that. You know, the vegetation that's growing there is so lush because of the, the rocks that are there. And you don't see the same things on the hills. They're not out grazing where the, the quartzite is. <laughs> They're grazing where the limestone is. Um, and when you're getting up on the hills and you see views like that and you have uh, huge ravens that are circling you all the time because they're interested to see who's going to drop a little bit of, of lunch. And when you're looking out uh, onto the hills, uh, it is just absolutely stunning. So, so we love that. It's a two week residential field course. It's a really immersive experience. And I say it's the level two excursion, but we actually have our students undertake this for two weeks. Um, right after their exams. So we generally go at uh, the end of June and the beginning of July. And for the majority of the past 10, 12 years, 15 years, our class was so big, we would actually have to run the trip twice. So we were booking out the lodge for four weeks. Um, and no matter how many staff love going for that length of time, you know, two weeks, we've never found any member of staff who actually wanted to stay for an entire four weeks. Although I can see Bob wiggling his fingers. I think I've even... volunteered multiple times. <laughs> Maybe this year, Bob, you never know. Um, but I'll let Bob tell you a bit more about that excursion. Uh, but, but they do it in between level one and level two. Uh, and, and that really, uh, I feel, is where they, they really become immersed in geology and, and they do sort of become nascent geologists. Um, what else do we do at Leeds? Uh, that's, those are the only places we really, really go. And, and Ascent is one of the main flagship field trips that we have. And students absolutely love it. We get amazing feedback from the students about that trip. And external examiners from other universities, uh, they always say that, that we do a really, really good job of training geologists at Leeds. Uh, and that training is sort of centered really around those two weeks in Ascent. And you couldn't get a better place um, to, to really sort of build those basic skills to that degree. Uh, beyond that, there aren't any other field trips that we run in Scotland, but staff offer a variety of dissertation mapping areas uh, in Scotland, um, ones that run almost every single year. Uh, Dan Morgan runs one in the Torren and Kilchrist area of Sky, that's sort of Ben and Dewey Granite area. 
there are several people who alternatively run projects around Gerlock or Loch Marie in the Northwest. Um, I have traditionally ran a mapping project on the Isle of Rasse. That's a, a beautiful little island between Skye and the mainland. It has an, an immense amount of geology for a tiny island, and, and that's kind of often a theme, I think, for Scottish geology. You can go to, you can go to one small island or one small peninsula, and the variety of geology you see is phenomenal. Uh, and I ran a mapping project on, on Rasse for a number of years, and then I switched over to the Isle of Carrara. Now, Carrara is somewhere that uh, I had my first experience of proper geological mapping. At, and this is an old geological map. This was the map that was done by Clough and Bailey and, and others, and it was published in 1922. This forms a tiny postage stamp sized area on the extreme sort of uh, southeast corner of the Isle of Mull map. Now, the Isle of Mull map was updated in the sort of early 90s, and it became the sort of special um, Isle of Mull East map where they didn't include Carrara. So one of the reasons I love uh, offering this as a mapping area project is because the, the map's never really been updated. And obviously the students are not mapping at this one to 63,000 scale. They're, they're mapping it at one to 10,000 scale. So there's a, a lot more detail um, than, than they, they can find on this map that they'll find on foot. And also the digital version of um, the, the, the map of Kara that you find on, on the newer um, interactive digital mapping sites that you have at, at the Ordnance Survey. Um, and, and there's the BGS, the sort of 3D maps viewer. Um, that is, that digitization is, digitization is based on this old map. And unfortunately there are a few errors on it. And I would say unfortunately, because they are errors related to some of the line work. But for me, it's fortunate because if the students go and copy it, I know exactly where they've made the mistakes. And, and this seems to be a bit of a theme, uh, it's a bit of a digression here, but um, myself and other colleagues have often wondered why there are, are, are errors in, in, in the geology or seem to be in some of the geology of real classic areas in terms of the maps. And, and we've come to the, the conclusion that it's probably because some you know, subtle but, but uh, specific errors have been left in to, to catch out students who are cheating just by straight up copying. Um, I love the Isle of Carra. It is a, a wonderful place. The original memoir from uh, 1922, so it's the, the, the sort of memoir for the pre-tertiary rocks of uh, Oban, Mull and Loch Alleyne. Um, and it, it opens with a gambit talking about um, the south coast, uh, the walk along the south coast of Kerr as being one of the finest geological walks in all of Scotland. And I would absolutely agree if nobody's had a chance to go there. Um, there's a foot ferry that takes you from here. This is about a two mile walk from Oban, which is just up here. Uh, and the foot ferry takes you over, no cars can go over and you can walk around the island in a circuit in about four hours. Uh, uh, if you're stamping around there um, and obviously you can stay all day but this south coast is absolutely gorgeous and Bob and I both had our introduction to geological mapping uh, on the Isle of Kerra because uh, the University of Glasgow and I, I still believe they take the students there um, the, your first foray into having three days of, of trying to puzzle out the geology of an area uh, is in Kerra and they basically pair you up uh, or, or put you in groups of three and they give you a small area to map and they just leave you to it, which is one of the best ways to learn. And if you're fortunate, um, you're one of the people that uh, uh, you have the tea garden in your area, which is just about here. I was not fortunate enough to, to have the tea garden in my area. So that's a little bit of a flavor of what we do at Leeds. Uh, and I don't want to talk too much more because I do want there to be room um, in the seminar for us to have conversation about what we could do more or to have people just converse about the wonderful geology of Scotland and, and, and their experiences of, of how it's interfaced or intersected with higher education. But I wanna pose a question right now, could or should we do more? And I think the answer is absolutely. Leeds definitely could use the geology uh, of Scotland more in our field teaching especially. Um, and Purely from a Leeds perspective, one of the reasons why we definitely could do more beyond the fact that the geology in Scotland is phenomenal. Um, the University of Leeds has recently created a new set of protocols for decarbonization. Uh, and this is all about moving towards more sustainable futures. Um, and we have to consider decarbonization in 
all aspects of university activity where possible. And that especially uh, relates to travel for research and for field trips. So many members of staff are, are not flying if they can avoid it. They're not going to overseas conferences if they can avoid it, or they're taking trains wherever possible rather than, than uh, uh, being alone in a vehicle um, or, or you know, flying. Now, we do have other field trips at Leeds uh, that happen in, in the final year where we go to Cyprus or, or we go to, to other um, places where you have to get a ferry over to Ireland or uh, you have to fly. Uh, but we are now being asked very seriously to consider any modifications to our course to consider not having to fly or to keep the field geology that we do within Britain. So if that's the case, then it makes sense that we look to Scotland as well as other parts of the UK to see how we can use uh, the UK's geology better. The first residential field trip we offer at Leeds goes to the Pembrokeshire Peninsula and we visit you know, everywhere from the very north in Fishguard right the way through to the, the south uh, west angle in, in Stackpole. And the geology there is, is wonderful. But it is a long way to get down there, not quite as long as it is for us to go up to Aston, but it's a long way. And the geology actually is quite one dimensional. It's mostly focused around uh, sedimentology and you maybe have a little bit of low grade metamorphic rocks and you have a few intrusions, uh, obviously the St. David's Head intrusion, but it doesn't, it doesn't, there's very few places near Leeds that can offer as much of a variety of geology that you might see if you were based, for example, in the central belt of Scotland for the reasons I spoke about before. So being an undergrad at the University of Glasgow, and I'm sure Bob can back me up on this, we were exposed to an incredible variety of geology uh, in our field classes at the University of Glasgow because you're so well placed to, you know, get up to the, the green schist fasces, uh, uh, you know, of the highlands just beyond the highland boundary fault. Um, you have the Ballantrae complex down uh, in, in south uh, west Ayrshire that you can get to very easily. And you have everything that, that, that is offered in terms of the Carboniferous geology, uh, which is the, both the sedimentology, the wonderful cyclothems, and the igneous geology um, that, that you have spanning you know, from Glasgow right the way through to Edinburgh. And then you even have the, the, the Fife Coast. So, so we went to St. Monans on day trips, uh, just as equally as we had residential trips to Mull and Oban uh, and Arran. So, you know, why should we not use uh, Scottish geology more? Because you can get to such a variety uh, over such a short space. Now, there are some barriers to this. And when Bob and I were chatting about this, we thought that, that some of the main barriers relate to um, what is stopping us from using the geoparks better. And I'll give a proviso right now. This has nothing to do with um, saying the geoparks are not doing things that they could be doing better. We think the geoparks are fantastic, but there, there's a common theme uh, that seems to be missing for all universities in Britain to be able to use the geoparks better. Um, so there's the four main geoparks. Uh, some of these are, are sort of European geoparks. I think the, the, the first three are, I'm not sure if Aaron is a, a European registered geopark or not yet. Uh, but the Northwest Highlands is the one I list first because it's the easiest one to exploit or to use fully um, as a university group. And that's because you have the Inchna Damp Lodge. It is a wonderful place that is huge. You can cater for up to 60 students uh, and staff can stay in the cottages around the outside. You're in a central location to be able to explore all the wonderful aspects of the geopark in the Northwest Highlands. Um, and it really is just that factor of accommodation. Uh, there are various places where you can stay in Loch Aber, Shetland, and obviously Arran. I know a lot of people run residential field classes in Arran, uh, but usually in Arran, you have to either be lucky and get into the Loch Ranza Field Center, and it's quite small, or you have to be quite creative uh, and you've got to get your students uh, it, you know, fully booked into a variety of the, the sort of smaller self-contained apartment uh, type uh, hostels um, and, and uh, you know, apartment complexes. Craigley Courts near, near Brodick is the one we stayed in in Glasgow. And that can be a little bit tricky. Shetland, obviously wonderful geology, but quite remote. Uh, and again, uh, a bit more logistical uh, challenge that has to be surmounted to be able to run a field trip there. So the accessibility issues regarding just getting to some of the remote locations, uh, 
but I think more than the accessibility issues, because we can get to the Northwest Highlands, Loch Haber, you can get all over, Arran, you can get to fairly easily, Shetland's a bit more difficult, but all of these places we feel apart from the Northwest Highlands um, has capacity issues uh, and logistical issues with respect to accommodation. And this is not just a matter of getting your students into a place where, you know, they could maybe feed themselves in small self-contained apartments uh, and, and, you know, you can all live comfortably, but it's about being able to have a space to teach them in. And that's quite difficult unless you actually have some form of accommodation that has uh, a, a, a space large enough and suitable enough for teaching. Uh, basically in the Northwest Highlands, in the Inchnadamf Lodge, um, the big uh, sort of breakfast, dinner, cooking area is also doubling up as a space that we teach in. Um, and it's a wonderful space for it. And, and everything else is self-contained within that big, wonderful lodge. Um, we don't know of anywhere else that, that offers that type um, uh, of sort of setup. And, and that's the, the, the main issue we think, which is the main barrier to the geoparks being used better. Now, recently I've become aware uh, of something because my sister works for uh, local government um, in, in East Ayrshire. And she uh, also works a little bit with the, the Holyrood government. Uh, and one of the things she alerted me to was uh, phase one um, of a, a sort of scoping study uh, about a geopark being centered uh, uh, in Ayrshire. And, and that, that was the Spire Slack uh, and Mains Hill Wood sites. So these are former open cast coal mining sites. And this was an initiative that was looked into, um, headed up by the Scottish Mines Restoration Trust and the, the BGS. And the feasibility uh, stage one um, of turning these areas into geoparks was completed about five years ago. Uh, I don't have much information about where this has gone now, um, but that phase one of the study seemed to be rather positive uh, about the possibility of turning these, into, these areas into a combined geopark. Now, some people weren't too, too hot on that idea. Other people I've spoken to who know Scottish geology well, weren't really sure it was feasible because they were saying, well, perhaps the geology there is a bit one dimensional as being open cast coal, mi uh, coal mining sites. Um, but there's a lot more that, that, that can be offered than just looking at the geology from an academic point of view. Um, there's the geo heritage that goes along with it. And there's also uh, a whole aspect of looking at these former sites and educating um, the public uh, as, as well as prospective students about what happens after you coal mine, what happens to the communities after you coal mine, uh, what happens in terms of um, putting the sites back to the way uh, they might, might have looked before a, a big hole was dug in the ground. And then that begs a question of, you know, should you, should you hide it all or should we actually keep some of it uh, uh, in terms of geo heritage? For those of you who are not entirely sure uh, where these two locations are, uh, here's the M8 running along here and you've got Uddingston uh, uh, right over here. So, so you're not far away from Glasgow. Um, here's the Mains Hill site. And in terms of spire slack, you're obviously going a little bit more towards, um, uh, towards the, the Kilmarnock direction. Um, so those of you who know the central belt portion of Scotland might be thinking, okay, well, you're, you're kind of in between, uh, you're in the countryside here, you know, you're, you're not in a place that's going to lend itself uh, very easily towards uh, a lot of students visiting. Um, and I think one of the main ways that you could really make a case for the Spire Slack and Mains Hill Wood sites becoming a geopark is not just because of the access to what you see there, but I would propose that you make that the center of a, a larger geopark that, that might include uh, a little bit more of Ayrshire. And if you're centered somewhere, like if you were able to center yourself somewhere near Uddingston, or I would say an even, even better place to try and center yourself would be in Kilmarnock because you know, that, that's only about a, a 30 minute drive away from Spire Slack. Um, then if you're based in Kilmarnock, and I know the, the, the Dean Country Forest Park has a new sort of um, accommodation and education facility, and my sister and I were talking about um, the possibility of, you know, using that as a base for the geopark to begin with. You know, if you're based in Kilmarnock, it's very quick to get here. There's Loudon Hill, which is not far from here that you can visit as a volcanic plug. 
you can have a day trip out to Edinburgh. You could visit Dynamic Earth in Edinburgh. You can obviously uh, have a look at Arthur's Seat. Uh, it's a slightly longer day trip, but you can get out to the wonderful rocks uh, on the Fife Coast and St. Monans is a wonderful uh, location. You can even do a lot of uh, engineering geology if you're kind of heading um, up the, the A82 towards uh, the highlands. And you got all the ge you have all the geology um, in, in East Ayrshire uh, and South Ayrshire uh, and Glasgow right close to you. So I would make the case that, you know, and I've made the case to the folks at the University of Leeds, if this was to ha you know, get going with the geopark and there was some form of accommodation that was created, um, it would be a no brainer for Leeds to turn around and say, that's where we're gonna uh, center one of our major, major residential field trips. You could center a two week residential field trip there with no problem. And you know, the variety of geology that you would see and world-class geology uh, is phenomenal. I think I've talked enough there, uh, I've probably gone over what I would uh, uh, aim to talk. So I'll pass over to Bob now. I gotta stop sharing, there we go. Yeah, I, th I think as is tradition, whenever me and Graham try and do something <laughs> together, Graham goes for 45 minutes. <laughs> um, let me just get screen sharing on, which is, has moved, there we go. Um, so I'll blast through this pretty quick. Um, hopefully you can all see this now. Yeah. Um, so Graham talked a lot about the, the sort of the how we view it on the education side, but I want to talk a little bit about the, the student experience of these kind of Scottish field trips. So again, for about the, the fourth time in this, this presentation, we're seeing Inch the Damp Lodge from yet another angle. Um, but really our ascent field course, which is what I'm going to talk about, is very, very much centred in there. It's in the heart of the geopark. It's, it's just ideal for what we do. Um, so, keyboard. so the, key th the key thing to talk about when it comes to our field trips is our students. So this is um, our ascent field trip from two years ago. Um, this is a fairly typical group of, of our students. So as you can see, they're they're an increasingly diverse bunch and they are approaching gender parity. We have international students in the mix and most of our students are English, but we get the odd, the odd Welsh, Northern Irish, Scottish student in the mix too. So for a lot of them, this is very, very far from home. This is a very much a new experience going out into the Scottish Hills. And increasingly, we're seeing students from demographics which are a bit more non-traditional, so people who maybe don't have experience in the outdoors before, who haven't been out in the hills like this. And nowhere is this better illustrated than at Knockin Crag in the Geopark, where there is a, a paired set of sculptures, one showing the, the classical geologists of Peach and Horn, and the other titled The Modern Geologist, which shows a modern geologist, one who uses technology, one who isn't just necessarily a, an old white man. Um, so we are, we are talking about a an interesting group of very, very different people from what is tradition. And for them, this experience of this two week, two week field trip is potentially life changing. It's what we call a liminal experience. It's something that is new, something that changes them, something that they remember forever. Uh, so this is, this is just a very brief overview of the field trip. Um, it's two weeks, 12 field days with a, a, a break in the middle. Um, and as Graham said, we, we kind of, we cover the Northwest Highlands Geobark at least in a side-to-side -side manner. We, we spend a few days on the coast at Achmelvik and um, along the coast towards Quack Tall. Um, traditionally then we did see the, the Stack Fada member, not anymore sadly. Um, and then we move back over to Loch Ass and, and we do a, a transect and then we do some, some actual mapping exercise training. Typically we take somewhere between about 30 to 40 undergraduates and um, at its peak up to about 60 between the two trips. Um, and they're between the first and second years. And it's a trip that's very focused around teaching them map, very traditional mapping training and field skills. Um, assessed as many people have been for almost 100 years in this country right, with a map, a notebook, and, and, a, and a written report component. Um, and this is their, their main preparation for their undergraduate mapping projects between the second and third year. So we pack a lot into this trip. Um, so very, very traditional map and compass um, and very focused on rock descriptions. Again, we make use of Knock and Crag at the Geopark here because it's, it's a good location that gets all that in a fairly tight space. 
and um, so it's a very very valuable teaching resource and there are some quite useful um, pieces of material at that site which we can take advantage of to help make our case and use as teaching aids. Uh, it is a it is a wonderful uh, visitor site it's it's excellent in every level. Yeah so th this sculpture here for example lets, a, lets us talk about the succession and it's you know something that we can physically point to that's right there to, to get our point across is incredibly valuable. And um, the other side of Knock and Crag, which is something that is often underappreciated with field work, is that there is a coach park and there are toilets there. These are, these are facilities that you do not get in a lot of places where we want to do field work and, and they are important. Like we are expecting students to spend entire days out in the fields. You need to you know, give them some facilities to help out with that. Um, so this again is another view of Ancient Amph and this is just to make the point that this is, this is a completely immersive experience. So they're spending two weeks fairly cut off from the world um, unless you're on I think it's three you do not get phone signal here. You are surrounded by geology, you wake up and you look out the window in the morning and it's, it's Darnest Limestone or it's Quartzite up on Ben Morrison and Conneval. It is just, they're just inundated with it. They, they can't do anything else. They just eat, sleep, dream geology. Um, so it's this hugely important experience for them. And we, this all happens in this contained space and this contained group of people. So it's, it's very, very important. And they come back years later having remembered this. And we find that students talk about going back to these places. And um, I, for one, have gone back to my mapping area in Fife more times than I've cared to admit. Um, and they're forming memories here. They're remembering, this was, this was two years ago, and they're remembering this absolutely gorgeous experience, this gorgeous weather, and something that challenged them, something that made an impression. Um, and they, they have individual little memories that just will, they will remember long beyond learning, you know, the difference between the basal quartzite and the pipe rock. That year, remember the time the beer truck broke down and they had to form a bucket line to help the locals. They remember the, the military planes that buzzed them flying low over the mapping area. And the waterfalls, the, the Caribbean-esque beaches, the, the food, and the very, very strange people who were teaching them. And so these are, these are hugely important trips to the student experience, and they make up a big part of what we offer in a geology degree. And, and aside from that, they get to see Scotland. So many of these students, particularly the ones from the University of Leeds, aren't Scottish. They may not have been to Scotland before at all and frequently they haven't been any further north than Leeds. So they're getting an exposure to Scottish culture and to the, the sort of Scottish tourist um, experience that they wouldn't otherwise get. So they come back and they talk about having to go over to the island on a, on a Calmac ferry or seeing deer or the classic selfie with the Highland cow that you have to convince the international students that's maybe not the greatest of ideas. Um, but it's really, it, it promotes the country and it's, it's very, very memorable to them. So it's something that lasts a lifetime. Um, and of course, it's not, all, it's not all great experiences. Some of it is, is difficult and challenging as well. And this is, this is where Scotland is great. So in the bottom left, this is our Glencoe mapping area. Um, and it's, it's not easy. When they're down in that area, down south of the road, it's difficult ground, the, the rocks aren't all 100% exposed as you might see in some uh, dry, arid sort of international field trip where there's not a lot of vegetation. They have to, they have to work for it and it's, it's that kind of desirable difficulty um, that makes this such a great learning tool. Um, they're also up against the weather, uh, whether that is more stereotypical Scottish weather of rain and snow and cold or as we've had on the last couple of field trips, massive heat waves and they're up against things like ticks and so they're learning these practical skills they're building a bit of resilience and they're forming these memories so again hugely important stuff uh, so i'll wrap it up there because i wanted to blast through that quite quickly so that we could have some time to have a group discussion and um, but me and graham had a little meeting this afternoon where we came up with a few areas that we think are are interesting places to discuss in relation to the scottish geology trust role and how that relates to some of the things that we at universities find useful or think we're missing when it comes to educational opportunities. So